we can do better than that. Good morning, church. Good morning. There we go. That's better. It's wonderful to see all of you this morning. I want to welcome you. Welcome our special family from Nature Trail. Welcome those joining us online this morning. Um, had a quick announcement this morning before we go into our worship service, and we'll probably do this two or three times over the next months or so, but in the pew in front of you, you're going to see this yellow card, or you might see a sign that has a QR code. We would like you sometime during the service today, take the time to fill out this card or scan that QR code. It'll take you to the right site. And we're just updating our files, making sure we have the correct phone number um, for you all. There's also a little important line on this, this yellow card that said, would you like to receive weekly text? And if you would, please check that. Um, every Sunday morning at 8 o'clock, you will get a text reminding you of the service and um, whatever might be going on special that day. And if there's any urgent prayer needs or anything like that during the week, uh, you would be on that group list that gets that text. So take the time to do that um, and help us just update our files. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7 says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace. Won't you stand as we sing about that grace? One, two, three, four. so much stronger, the King of glory, the King above all kings, who shakes a hole with holy thunder, and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder, the King of glory, the King above all kings, this is amazing grace. you would take my place, that you would bear my cross, you lay down your life, so that I would be set free, oh, Jesus I sing for all that you've done for me. the orphan, a son and daughter, the King of glory, the King of glory, who rules the nations with truth and justice, shines like the sun and all of his brilliance, the King of glory, the King of all kings. This is amazing grace, this is amazing Take my place, that you would bear my cross. You lay down your life, so I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the king who conquered the grave. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. Worthy is the king who conquered the grave. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. Worthy is the king who conquered the grave. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. This is amazing grace. sing for all that you've done for me. All that 
Sing it to him. Jesus. Holy and anointed one. Some of you might still be in school right now, but do you remember when the instructor would come in and he said, take out a piece of paper and a pen, we're having a pop quiz? Well, today's the day. Yeah. Just kidding. Yeah, that's what I always said. When in doubt, the answer is always C, so just remember that. So. Now, we're going to do a self-evaluation today. Uh, it's kind of like a pop quiz. Every now and then, we probably need to do this. But we're going to, each of us are going to do a self-evaluation on our spiritual foundation. How is your spiritual foundation today? If we do not have this foundation, we will not stand the trials of this life, and trials will come. John 16, says, I have told you these things, that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. And the word that Randy likes is the word but. But take heart. I have overcome the world. That was Jesus talking there. I'm going to uh, read some words today off of, i got two songs. One of, them, one of them, the older generation probably knows really well. Younger ones probably not as much, but that's fine. And the second song I'm going to read the words to talks about the first song, same message, just this different, wrote at different times. This first song was written in 1863. And if you remember from school, uh, 1863, what was going on in America at that time? 
since the Civil War. We were in the middle of the Civil War. That war lasted almost to the day, four years. This was written in 1863. Civil War ended in April of 1865. So you can imagine the foundations that those spiritual folks back then had during that time. Can you imagine? I mean, we're in wars now, nothing in our own land, but can you imagine what was happening at that time? Well, during that time, this song was written. I'm going to read the words. You'll know the song, I'm sure. It's in the Bab out of the Baptist hymn. It says, My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. His oath, his covenant, his blood, support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. When he shall come with trumpet sound, O oh, may I then in him be found. Dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. Psalm 18.2 says, The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my God is my rock, whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Psalm 95.1 says, Come let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. In the first Samuel 2.2, this is known as Hannah's prayer. There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. Second song I'm going to read this morning. It's a newer one. It's uh, coming to be a favorite of, of mine. It's called Firm Foundation. And the words go like this Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. When everything around me is shaken, I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus because he has never let me down. He's faithful through generations, so why would he fail me now? <laughs> yeah. I still got joy and chaos. I've got peace that makes no sense. So I won't be going under. I'm not held by my own strength because I've built my life on Jesus. He's never let me down. He's faithful in every season. So why would he fail me now? He won't. Rain came and wind blew, but my house was built on you. I'm safe with you. I'm going to make it through. I'm going to make it through because I'm standing on you. I'm going to make it through because my house is built on you. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. When everything around me is shaken, I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus because he's never let me down. He's faithful through generations, so why would he fail me now? He won't. Remember, that last part of John 16, 33 says, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So how is your spiritual foundation today? Can do a self-evaluation. Trials and troubles are going to come no matter what. If you're breathing, trials are coming. So, but one day, those trials will be over, thanks to Jesus. So I hope everyone's got their communion uh, ready. And at this time, I'll go ahead and say a prayer and then take your communion. Father God, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for sending him to this world on our behalf. We were in need of a Savior, and you gave us one. We thank you, Jesus, for dying for us. Just take this moment to uh, accept our worship and honor and glory to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Go ahead and take your communion at this time. I will go ahead and pray an offering prayer as well. If you haven't given the offering, the offering boxes are in the back. There's also one up here on the table if you feel like you need to. And we appreciate all the offerings and tithes. Father God, we thank you for blessings of life. We thank you for allowing us to be here. We thank you for providing with, with all the blessings and the monies that we need to survive. Lord, take these offerings and tithes, use them to your glory, and that others might come to know you as Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name.
and I will worship you with all of my heart. I will worship you with all of my mind. I will worship you with all of my strength. For you are my we prepare to worship and study today, I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and pray with me as we get started. God, we just want to uh, bow and worship and honor and glory to you. We thank you for the sunshine today and for the warmer weather coming. Thank you for uh, just the provision of this place, this building, this church building that you have uh, blessed us with. Thank you for the opportunity to lift up your name, to glorify you, for the opportunity to sing and pray for your word, your truth, the Bible, that as we study, we pray for clarity and wisdom in that. Lord, we do want to lay down before you our sins, our lives, to ask your forgiveness, to ask for your cleansing and righteousness, for you are the only one that can make us holy. Lord, forgive us, use us, fill us, uh, make us ready for worship here and now. I thank you for these men and women. I thank you for their hearts, their minds, their strength, their desire to be to you. It's in your name, Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. So if I ask a question, do you want a blessing today? How do you answer? Yes. Well, of course you want a blessing today. You want to be blessed. And we hear the phrase blessed or blessing all the time. Now, I'm going to ask you another question because as we jump into our study today, we're going to do some mapping in the Bible. And basically when we talk about mapping, we're talking about looking at stories throughout the scriptures and what God's Word says about what it is to be blessed and things of nature. The question I'm going to ask you is, what is motivation? I want you to think about that. What motivates you? What drives you? What, when you go to work, 
Do you go to work because of your motivation and love for that workplace? Or because you're getting a paycheck at the end of the week, you know? Uh, when used to be there were some times in my own life, some of my motivations for going to some different church events was because I knew I was getting to go out to eat afterwards. Now, I'm not saying that's my motivation today. I'm saying when I was a younger man. But, you know, we think about what it is that truly motivates us. Uh, this is one question I ask especially maybe this time of year, and, and please listen just carefully because when we think about church and going to church and the opportunity to praise and worship God, we think, what is that motivation? And, and I'll, I'll share just personally. I had an extended family member, and, and, and uh, this family member, we would go to their house sometimes, and we'd go to church, and oftentimes my extended family member would, would not want to go to church or the service or whatever because they didn't feel up to it or, or physically didn't feel capable or whatever the case was. We all know that. I mean, there's time people are going through stuff and they you know, may not feel the best to be able to get up and actually be a part. But when we got back from service, who do you think was the first person that wanted to go out to eat or go shopping at like Kmart or someplace like that? I'm not talking about for five, ten minutes. I'm talking about for an hour or two. These follow what motivation. Um, and I always ask, and now hear me right, but I'm a preacher, okay? And, you know, on a Sunday morning, so often there's so many things. Life is busy. People are busy. Uh, there's bad weather, things of that nature. But this is a question I'll ask, and maybe I shouldn't ask it here, but I'm going to anyways. Yeah, I, I don't care sometimes. But here's the question is, when there's a church service, I think to myself, when, when I don't see family, friends, or people, if today was a work day, would they not be able to make it to work? You ever have that moment? And I'm not pointing fingers, I'll point it straight up. But, you know, I've been there. I'm not saying anybody else guilty or more so than another, but I've been there. Today, as we come into this house of God, maybe our motivation, our drive isn't exactly correct, but that's what we're here for. We're here to learn, to grow, mature, to understand what that true motivation looks like and to have that blessing of God. Now, today we're going to be talking about the body as an acrostic just to help us remember these four main points of what we're looking at. The body in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 14 through 16, it says, and the previous passage to this says that God will give some to be apostles, prophets, teachers, uh, all these different uh, positions or, or, or leadership, things of that nature in the church. It says after that, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men and their deceitful scheming. And if you feel like that's going on today, there's deceitful scheming. Maybe we don't get all the news or we don't get all the right information. We're only being told the stories they want us to hear. This says when we grow up in that word of God or we grow up in the word of the truth, then we're not going to be tossed back and forth by all those different teachings. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head. Who's that head? It says that head is Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 16, from, the whole, from him the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So... The head be the Lord Jesus Christ, the body be all of us here. And I think sometimes even in a bigger picture that the body is the world, universal, the national, whatever you want to say, church. You know that Southwest, uh, you know all the other different church families in this town that we're that body. And as each part does its work, we're a fulfillment, that kingdom of God to be doing that work as the body of of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, under this acrostic, the first word we're going to look at is the B, and that is blessing. All you said you wanted a blessing today, let's look at what it says in God's Word. Genesis chapter 12, it says that the Lord said to Abram, 
This is before his name became Abraham, or as a lot of us have heard, Father Abraham, said, leave your country, your people, your father's household, and go to the land I will show you, and I will make you into a great nation. And here's this blessing, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. Now, before I read verse 3, you all remember last week, we were talking about the Tower of Babel. And in the Tower of Babel, the people had gathered into one place, with a common goal that they were going to be able to tower that was going to reach the heavens. And their purpose in doing that, it says in the scripture, is that they wanted to make a name for themselves. And yet here in verse 3, under, or in verse 2 under Abram, in Genesis 12, it says that God is going to take Abram and make him, to make his name great. Not because of, what do you think that big factor difference was? What was the motivation? Abram loved the Lord. He had a relationship with him. The t- people of the Tower of Babel it made the sound that they were after their own glory. Abram was after the glory of God. Verse 3, I will bless those who bless you, and ever, whoever curses you I will curse, and all peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. And a quick reminder, we know that God used the people of Israel This people, he highlighted them as his favorite people that he showed the message of love and grace through. But it says literally in the Bible that through Abram, this covenant that's going to be made with him, that every one of us is going to be blessed. And eventually that lineage comes all the way up to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now today we're talking about this blessing. What does it mean to be blessed? Well, as we read there in Abram, it meant that he was going to become a great nation that his name was going to become great. And literally, it it talked about the idea of relationship people. And one of the things we see in that idea of being blessed was that he was going to be many people, and there would be so many people that would come from him that you couldn't even begin to count how many people, or just this idea of such a large amount. So the first we see this blessing in the favor of God. Now, when we talk about mapping, we talk about that sin enters into the world. You remember when sin entered into the world? You got Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. The serpent comes in and says, did God really say which Eve should have responded? Adam should have responded and said what? Yes, he did, but they didn't. They had that desire in their heart. And, you know, they probably had noticed the fruit of the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and they had wanted it. But they try to keep their attention away from it. What Satan do? He tends to draw our attention, our ideas. He knows what we struggle with. And so he tends to draw our attention back to that again. Or that coping mechanism to deal with life. He draws us back to it again so that we want it, that we desire it. And that's when sin entered into the world. And as we see here, sin, it tends to multiply and increase. Y'all know that, I'm sure. But it's like the old idea of poison ivy. Well, they always tell you, what does your mama and papa, your dad, your grandma, grandpa, always say, when you get poison ivy, what are you supposed to not do? Don't scratch it. Don't itch it. And the reason they would say that is why? Because when you scratch it, the more you want to scratch it. And if you get that oil spread around, it continues to spread on your body. And that tends to be what we see in sin. Just like a bag of potato chips. You know what I'm talking about. Oh, I'm just going to open this bag and have just a couple of chips. You know, this just happened to me the other day. A very sweet friend of mine, a wonderful executive administrator of the church, gives me some Linden chocolates. She says, get these out of my office. There's like seven or eight of them. And, you know, I'm like, okay, I can do this. Maybe one a day. Within 10 minutes, they're all gone. <laughs> we know the process of sin. Sin increases. It multiplies. It always desires more. It's never fulfilled. It's never, you're never going to get enough of it. We read this in throughout the scriptures uh, that the result of that, going from blessing, is that you're going to be cursed or have non-favor. And as we map through Genesis up to chapter 12, we read of that time again. We have the Cain and Abel story. 
Uh, the Bible literally says that God looked with favor upon Abel's offering that he gave, but with Cain he looked with non-favor. Uh, Cain is upset by this, and God literally says to him, listen, if you don't do what's right, sin is crouching at your door and wants to do what? Devour you or have you. But, the Bible says, the Lord tells Cain, you must master it. Meaning that your thought, your mind must be over it. As we read through the scriptures, we read of Cain, Abel, we read of Noah, we read of the Tower of Babel, we read of all these things in, in Hebrews. It gives a lot of context in Hebrews 11. It says that the righteousness was applied to Abel. The righteousness was applied to Noah, not because of a righteousness that was in and of their own, but because of the righteousness of God. He looked with favor and blessing upon them because they loved him and served him. Here on the screen, we've been seeing this chronological lineage of God's people. Up here on the screen, we got Noah to Abraham. I want to highlight just a couple of additional things that we've been looking at over the last couple of weeks. The flood happened in 1656 B.C., before Christ. And when we read that, uh, some of the things you notice... Number one, talking about Abram today, Noah died two years before Abram was born. Look how quickly that window shortens, how they knew each other and had relationship. Abram comes from the lineage of the son, Shem. Do you, can you see it on the screen there? Shem lived from 1558 to 2158. If you look down to Abraham, he was born in 2008 and lived to 2,183. Literally a difference of 25 years from when Shem died to when Abraham died. Now let that sink in for a moment. Remember we said when we had the flood, God did a reset. God brought Noah and his sons to be this true blessing and relationship of God to man to God and in the period of just less than 200 years it was all messed up again any of you all I always have heard this phrase growing up you dig your own grave lie in it what's a phrase like that mean we tend to mess up our own stuff all right the mess we get into life you know, so often we can point fingers, we can blame people, but ultimately it boils down to, you know, I didn't turn in my homework. I didn't do what I should have done. I, I had opportunities. I didn't work hard. I, you know, whatever the case is, we can say we dug our own home. I shouldn't have been involved in that. I shouldn't have spent my money this way. You know, all these different thoughts that come to mind. We dig our own holes. Can you go back to that uh, previous screen there of the uh, lineage? As we look at that lineage, I want you to note, in the scripture it said, I believe it's Genesis chapter 6, that God was not going to contend with man for all this many years. And he said he was going to limit the number of years. Do you remember how many years he said he was going to limit your life to? 120 here about two weeks ago in the United States of America, we had an individual just turn the age, the oldest United States citizen of 116. Pretty old. But their time is coming. <laughs> in the Bible, we know, when you look at Noah, it shows here on the screen, Noah lived 950 years. Do you know what's happened? Most of the people previous to Noah lived to be in their 900s. His grandpa, 969. Now one of his uh, previous grandpas, 777, he passed. That's still a long time. But we see that they all lived almost 900 or more years. That was the mark of the blessing of God or all that. When the flood comes, notice that black line is where that flood happens. Notice what starts happening to the ages. 600, 438, 433, 464. So the age starts dropping off real quick after that flood happens worldwide. Then note 
When Peleg is born, Peleg, it says in the scriptures, name literally meant scattered people. Or that the people were scattered at that time or placed all around the world. And when that happened, notice what happens to the ages. All of a sudden, we're down into the 200s, even dropping below 200 now. Do you see what happens? As sin and brokenness enters into the world, as things change within our atmosphere and things of that nature, all of a sudden, our ages have dropped tremendously. I just highlight all that to you because I want you to understand what sin does. Not only does sin break us up, but it also affects the world, the planet. Sin breaks everything, and there is a price to be paid for it. Now, as we look at the next portion of this, the O is for obedience. And there's no getting around this. If you want to be blessed, if you want to receive the blessing today, the O word is always there. God tells us that we have to obey. Why is obedience so important? Y'all have, many of you in this room have raised kids. Why was it so important for your kids to obey you? Because you were just a mean tyrant? You liked having it your own way? Right, because you didn't want them to get hurt. You wanted them to know what it takes to get ahead or survive or to, to do things right. You know, I remember struggling one time when I was a young dad and we would rake leaves with the boys and I wanted every leaf off the ground. So, you know, what's that normal thing that that dad struggles with? You know, they rake their area and then what do you want to do? Well, you want to go back over it to get the rest of the leaves. And so I had to fight in myself. Don't go back over it. It's going to make them feel like they didn't do good or right. And so I had to struggle with that. We understand that obedience in family and life is important. If you're working somewhere, any of you employed, do they have a certain way that you, they want you to do the work? Why is that? Because they're mean? Or is it because they got a product, they got a way, and this is the best way to do it? Now, some of us would differ. We would say that's not the best way, and that's why we get upset. But God, indeed, is our spiritual dad. And he knows what's going to take us down. He knows what's going to destroy us. He knows what's going to rip our souls apart. He knows what we need more than anything else. And what is it? We need him. So he gives us guidance and direction, parameters for life, not to punish us, but to bless us. As we read in the obedience part here in Genesis chapter 12, verse 4, so Abram left all, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. Now, uh, we'll explain some of that geographical stuff here in a second. Verse 5, he took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated and all the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out from the land of, uh, for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Moriah at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there, he went on towards the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Then Abram set out and continued toward the Negev. So we look at this journey. Why did Abraham set out? Because God told him to. He was obedient to that. He stepped out in faith. Now, was this just a, a little jaunt down the road? I mean, was Abram just getting up from Mount Vernon and heading out to Bonnie? No, as we look here on the screen, you'll notice there's two rivers here on the right, uh, the Tigris and Euphrates. Those rivers are named from the Garden of Eden. Literally, it tells us that originally, Abram and his family, his dad, Terah, lived in Ur, which is number one down there in the far corner. The land of Ur is modern-day Iraq. 
Uh, we see Babylon was part of that, the kingdom of Babylon. That was that area. When they moved, God told them or played it on the heart of Abram and apparently his dad as well because his dad started the journey. They traveled up to Haran, which is number two, the top of the peak on the picture. That was a distance of almost 600 miles. Yeah. So when you think about Terah, this older dad that was taking his sons, and they were moving on as God had laid it on his heart. You know, I, I often try to help people see God laid this on his dad's heart before it ever came to Abram. And his dad was setting out as well. His son finished the journey. Now, when we look at this, <clears throat> when God called him to move on from Haran down to this promised land, <clears throat> when he moves down to Chechem, how many miles do you think that might be? That's 400 miles. So we're not talking about just a little jaunt. It'd literally be like you and I this day, well, maybe not today, we'll wait till tomorrow when it's warmer, but it'd be like us leaving out of Mount Vernon and walking not only to New York City, but another about 80 miles on past New York City. Can you imagine? Yes. Walking, pushing, carts, things of that nature. So when God calls them out of their homeland, it's not an easy task. Quick reminder, God always requires obedience before a blessing. Do you understand that? Most of us probably grew up with this understanding in our houses. You know, we were told as kids, do your chores, do your tasks, then you get a cookie. Not, here's a cookie, go do your task. We always did it backside. And that was the same as we read through God's word. I always try to want to highlight what we learned as kids and things of that nature, what we understand as human and human relationship, because if we understand it on this level, surely we can understand it between God and us on that level. When God asks us to do something, he's not asking as a tyrant. He's asking as a loving father, being obedient to that father, allows us to understand that blessing. Now, we'll move on here. The next part of this, the D of body is deeded. Any of you ever been deeded a piece of land? How many of you ever been deeded land you didn't necessarily want? All right. Just a quick picture to that. I've got some land in Florida. My dad was one of those guys that bought some swamp land. Do any of y'all remember that? Back in the late 60s, 70s, Florida was selling off all their land. Well, I got me some swamp land now. However, my swamp land is no longer swamp land, right? And you know where that picture goes. Because all that time, back then, it wasn't much, and he bought it for just pennies on the dollar. Now today, that land is worth something. We understand the idea of being deeded land. In the scriptures, God says that I am going to give you this promised land and that land will be the nation of, and where are we talking about? Israel. That that piece of land, for some reason, on this speck of dust in the universe, on the earth, is the land that God has deeded to his people. And yet, throughout all history and time, that little piece of land has been the center of so much blessing, contention, all those things that the spotlight of the world is still on that piece of land. Let's read what it says. Uh, in Genesis 12, verses 10 through 20, Abram goes down to Egypt. God get, guides him, protects him, blesses him through the whole thing. They went down there because of a famine. Then they returned back. Chapter 13, verse 1. So Abram went up from Egypt to the Negev with his wife and everything he had, and Lot went with him. Abram had become very wealthy in livestock and in silver and gold. Now, just a quick side note to that. You know, the blessing of God's hand, his favor was upon Abram. Even in the midst of traveling 
and being an, an outsider, a foreigner in these lands, God was still pouring upon him the blessings of silver and gold and provisions to be used. Verse 3, from the Negev, he went from place to place until he came to Bethel, uh, to the place between Bethel and Ai where his tent had been earlier and where he had first built an altar. Then Abram called on the name of the Lord. Now, in between those next coming verses, verses 5 through 13, Abram and Lot go separate ways. Uh, remember, he let Lot choose which land he went into. We look at the following verses. Verse 14, the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had parted from him, he says to him, lift up your eyes from where you are and look north, south, east, and west. All the land that you see, I will give to you and your offspring forever. I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth so that if anyone could count the dust, then your offspring could be counted. Go walk through the length and breadth of the land, and I, I am giving you. So Abram moved his tent and went to live near the great trees of Mamre at Hebron, where he built an altar to the Lord. Again, going back to the idea of blessing, what was the blessing that God said he was going to pour out on Abram? He was going to give him that land. He was going to deed him that land. And that his descendants were going to be what? So numerous that they'd be like the, the specks of sand on a beach or seashore. Think of that. And he's telling this to a guy that had no offspring. How's that possible? And you remember, just this isn't in the lesson for today, but how old was Abraham when Isaac was born? He was 100. His wife was 90. And that's pretty old, even for back then in the scriptures, because he didn't live but another, what was 37 years beyond that, I believe. Maybe it was a little longer than that. Anyways, when we talk about the blessings that are poured out upon us, we know that that blessing is dependent on obedience, and that with that obedience comes the deeding of property. Now, I know some of you might be asking the question, well, what property did I get deeded for being a Christian? And I know a lot of you already know the answer. We've been told throughout God's word, this is where faith comes in from the beginning to revelations. We have been told that when we become a son or daughter of the most high God, that we have been deeded land eternally in heaven. Eternally. The last part of what we're going to read today is that talking of the yielding, the why in that acrostic of body is yielding. And as we look in the scriptures, it says starting in chapter 14, Lot and his family were captured and they were carried off. Uh, there was a big war, the five kings versus four kings. Actually, the four kings were stronger than the five. It says that Sodom and Gomorrah were in the midst of these battles and that they were defeated. Verse 13, one who had escaped came and reported this to Abram the Hebrew. Now Abram was living near the great trees of Mamre the Amorite, a brother of Eskel and Anar, all of whom were allied with Abram. When Abram heard that his relative had been taken captive, he called out the, and how many number? what's that number? 318 trained men born in his household and went in pursuit as far as Dan. Just real quick. Um, some of you, any of you here been in war? I know a few of you were military. You know, when you talk about wars, rumors of wars and all these things, and you're planning for battle, does 318 sound like a good number to take? I mean, that's kind of ludicrous. And it's wild. And it just sounds like they're just like, okay, get the 318 trained guys and go get them. They're taking on four nations here of an army that's huge, and they send out their 318 to go get his nephew back. We read on. It says, during the night, Abram divided his men to attack them. He routed them, pursuing them as far as Hobah, north of Damascus. He recovered all the goods and brought back his relative Lot and his possessions together with all the women and the other people. After Abram returned, well, before I read, read that next part, 318, 
How did it work? It says that they got him back. And here's one of the things. We don't get the full grasp of the picture, but we read it elsewhere in the Bible. Remember at the, the fall of the walls of Jericho? The Israelites went over to take over the promised land, and God tells this great story of how they walked around the city and the walls came crumbling down. We've all sung those songs probably. Beautiful, wonderful picture. And then they go on to their next battle with this small little town. And then in the midst of that battle, some of their soldiers died. Do you remember their reaction? They were shocked because people died in a war. Can you picture that? Are you ever surprised on the news when you hear that somebody from the United States has died in the midst of a battle? That's not something that surprises us. It's something we expect. And yet the nation of Israel, God's people, the Hebrew, when they said that God's favor was upon them and they went into battle, the plan was we win. No one dies. We all come home. Do you, does it sound like that in this verse? 318, they go out, they attack the army, they get all their people back, they bring Lot and all them back, and doesn't report of anyone being killed or injured in the midst of it. It's amazing. Do you all want that kind of blessing? I want that blessing. I've been in that blessing. One quick story. So I was a youth minister, youth minister once upon a time. And one night, I had dropped my wife off in Springfield because we was going on a trip out of town, taking the youth. And I was driving home. And I felt like I was Mario Andretti, okay? I was trying to get home quick. It was dark. It was late. I got to get going. So I'm turning on to Interstate 64 from Nashville off that little uh, road there, 127. And as I do that, I'm like, I'm going to cut the curve. I'm going to make it sharp. I'm going to get there quick. Well, unfortunately, part of that wasn't paid. And so as I went across that, uh, my car kind of did one of those real not, you know, not good things. And you hear not good things. But I'm Mario Andretti. So I get home as quick as I can. I drive that car on down the interstate, probably right to speed limit. No. But got home, and the next morning... I'm home, I'm getting ready to get all these youth group kids onto this trip. I start to back out of my yard or out of my driveway, and before I get out of the driveway, the car literally just, the wheel just goes whoosh, and goes out to the side, and the car's just sitting there in the driveway. And then they tell me, actually, Clarence, you could probably tell me that little spring there or arm that holds that wheel was broken in half. Now, I'm not a mechanic, but I feel like me running the car off the road and back onto the road might have to have something to do with it. And driving however far it is from Nashville to Mount Vernon on that wheel, unbroken, making it home, to me that's a miracle of God. So often we lose sight of what true blessing really is. And man, God does bless us. And he provides for us. And he takes care of us. Our culture has done a great disservice in telling the church that blessing is an idea of money and material possession. Can God give us blessing that way? Absolutely. But that is not the crutch or the core of it. His hand of favor. His time that he has brought you through the thick and the thin. And every one of you I know have stories like that. That is a favor and hand of God on you. Never lose sight of it. Praise and glorify him. This is the last part of this yielding. After all this has happened and God had protected his people. Verse 17, after Abraham returned from defeating uh, Kedor Lamur, I, I, I butcher it. And the kings allied with him. The king of Sodom came out to meet him in the valley of Shaveh, that is, the king's valley. Then Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High, 
And he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth. All right, so two kings have come out. Who was the first one? The king of Sodom, the one that had lost the war, coming out for his people. Uh, and then another king comes out. Who is the king? The king of Salem, which we know today as Jerusalem. It says his name is Melchizedek, a priest of the Most High God. Later on in the New Testament, we read that he comes from a lineage that is never tracked, doesn't ever say. Doesn't ever say how he has a relationship with God. Doesn't ever say that where he comes from. As a matter of fact, it even compares Jesus Christ to Melchizedek because he's of that same kind of a lineage, the same kind of understanding. What I want to get across today, I want you to understand that when it talks about God using Abraham and doing these beautiful and wonderful things, that the nation of Israel is born out of that and he does these beautiful and wonderful things, that that's not just the story. Do you all grasp that? God was working his miracles, doing his thing, long before any of that. Terah had it on his heart, the father of Abram, that he was to go to this land. Melchizedek, long before Israel was in Jerusalem, was already there. And God had called him to be one of the, God, uh, the high priests of God. God was working in mysterious and wonderful ways. Verse 20, And blessed be the God most high who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. The king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the people and keep the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord God most high, creator of heaven and earth. I have taken an oath that I will accept nothing belonging to you, not even a thread or a thong of a sandal, so that you will never be able to say, I made Abram rich. I will accept nothing but my men, but what my men have eaten, and the share that belongs to the men who went with me, to Adner, Ashkel, and Mamre. Let them have their share. So we see this um, interaction. We see that Abram wins this battle. We see that these kings come out. He gives everything back to Sodom except one thing. Did you catch it? He gave 90% of everything back to the king of Sodom. What happened to the other 10%? It went to the king of Salem, the priest of the most high God. It says that Abram, and if we look at that acrostic, that yielding, Abram yielded that blessing, that money, that tithe to the king of Salem. Why? It's one of the weirdest little recordings of a story in the scriptures that we have. This man, Melchizedek, comes out of nowhere. He praises and worships God and is considered a high priest of his. And then Abram turns around and yields a tenth of everything to him. Why do you think God puts a story like that in the middle of this bigger picture for you and I? When I asked earlier during the service, beginning of this sermon time, does it, who wants a blessing today? Was there anybody that didn't want a blessing today? Okay, so I assume all of you want a blessing today. When we talk about having the blessing, what's it require? Well, it requires our obedience. Because of that day, we'll receive that deeded land of eternity forever in heaven, the truth of blessing. But the ultimate requirement to that ongoing relationship is for you and I to yield humbly before the Lord God Almighty and recognize him as the source of all hope, life, and truth. When we talk about motivation... Our motive in this life, and maybe we got to practice, maybe we got to work out, maybe we got to continue to, to learn and grow, and maybe we need reminders constantly before us, but our motivation is to glorify God. Bottom line. When I come to church, I'm here to glorify God. 
That's when the blessing comes. You come to church to glorify self, guess what? The blessing don't come. Who wants the blessing? We all do. So we yield humbly before the Lord. Quick review of the acrostic here. The B was blessing. The O is obedience. The D is deeded. And then the Y was yielding. I'm going to ask you this morning, let's practice this. We're getting ready to sing a song of invitation and decision. I want you to practice it right now. Your mind, your motivation is fully, wholly, truly to God. When you're looking at those words on the screen or listening to that music, in your heart and mind, you're going to give all you have to worship him. Now, I know some of you say, well, he's going to say, sing out loud. I think that's a great recommendation. You, good idea, guys. Sing out loud. But as we sing, we sing the glory and the truth of the word. Um, if you're not singing out loud, that doesn't mean that you're not worshiping. Only you can determine that in your heart and your mind. Sometimes I bow my head in humble reverence and awe as I sing. Sometimes I might raise hands in praise and glory to God. Sometimes I may sing out loud. Other times I don't even sing the words. Sometimes I'm just praying. Sometimes I'm just thinking. Sometimes I, but in all those situations, the condition to whether or not I am genuine and true to God is the motivation, that heart, am I focusing my heart, mind, soul, strength to God? I want us all to practice that together right now. I'm going to pray. Our praise team's going to come up and lead us. If you're wanting to stand, if you're wanting to kneel where you're at, uh, if you want to raise hands, however that looks, God's laying on your heart already probably. The Spirit is going to lead you in it. Trust and obey in that and, and follow through. Let's pray. Lord God, we come before you as your servants, uh, as your children, as those that are made righteous and holy through your blood and the sacrifice that you've poured out. Lord, we know that you're the one that makes us great and restores. You're the one that makes us available for that worship and that honor and glory to you. So, Lord, I pray for a clarity in our minds and our hearts right now to be to you, to glorify you, to worship you in reverence and awe, to have a clear picture of who you are, God, what you've done, God, and what you continue to do. We give all praise and honor to you, Jesus Christ. Thank you for life. Thank you for newness. Thank you for you. It's in your almighty name we pray. Amen. Please stand or kneel.
You know, sometimes we deal with some pretty difficult things in church service. Uh, and In our sermons, sometimes things come up that are, you know, rough. And when we talk about true motivation, we all know in this room it's easy. Uh, if you really do have true questions about whether your motive is to draw near to him, and as we've been singing here, and he'll come near to you, you know, sit down and have that conversation. Sit down with one of the people in your church family. Sit down with me and have that conversation. I want my motive, I want my drive to be for the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't want it to be just because I see you all looking at me. I want to love and worship him genuinely, purely, wholly. And I'm trying to do that. I, I can say that honestly before you. I'm trying to do that with all my heart and soul. So I want to encourage you each to that. If there's something that's holding you back in that, please, please deal with it. Uh, if you haven't surrendered your life to Christ, if you haven't been baptized, if you're not walking in that relationship, don't let anything stop you from that. That's between you and the Lord God Almighty. Step in and get it done. Reminders, we've got our prayer requests here in the bulletin. Make sure and pray over those things on a daily basis. Up here on the screen, we've got a couple of those uh, um, announcements. First, that QR code for the prayer. Make sure to do that. Uh, if you're a first-time guest, we've got a gift for you. We'd love for the, the, a cup that has some information and things in it. We'd love for you to have. If you have been a guest and have not received one of those, please let us know, and we'll, we'll get you one of those today. Um, also, we've got, we got the responsibility for the Lifeboat Meal coming up on February 27th. Uh, Super Kids is looking for a teacher helper. Um, we've, we've got uh, three in rotation. We usually have four. That's one time a month that they do that. So uh, speak to Melinda if that's something for you. And then the other notes coming up, we've got, uh, we're hosting the sunrise service this year. That's at 6 a.m. on resurrection morning, or as a lot of people call Easter morning, 6 a.m. We'll need people to help with cooking, breakfast, breakfast casseroles, all that sort of thing. So all you early bird people, something to look forward to. That's on March 31st. And the camp has out their weeks of camp now uh, for Southern Illinois Christian Service Camp. We will get to have a hear from him next week. So uh, make sure and uh, come prepare for that. Any other announcements I missed? Um, yeah, you can drop that in the offering box or give it to one of us, uh, myself or the back booth there. Let's pray. God, we thank you again for this day. Thank you for safety and getting here. Thank you for the opportunity to praise and worship. Help us in our motivation and our drive for you, Lord Jesus, to glorify you, to worship you, and to see others come to you. It's in your almighty name, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. This is amazing grace. Sing for all that you've done for me. All that 
May God's grace be upon you this week. May his love and mercy rest in your heart. And may he guide your steps in Jesus' name. Have a great afternoon.